In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. We do bless your name because you brought us in here. We ask you, O oh Lord, that your power will come down tonight. The signs of the apostles and the signs of the prophets and the signs of the evangelists and the signs of the commissioned ministers of God will come down and be manifested tonight in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, that you will magnify the name of Jesus. Every vessel here will be filled to overflowing. Unction from above, anointing from above, power from above will fill everyone and saturate everyone in Jesus' name. I pray that every brother here, every sister here will become a wonder. Whatever area of the work we are, we are walking, I pray the wonder walking power of God will fall upon every life in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that in everyone, with everyone, the name of Jesus will be magnified. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Let's be seated tonight. We're looking at the word of God. And then we're expecting great, great things from the Lord. Signs for commissioned leaders. Signs for commissioned leaders. If you know anything about the children of Israel, the children of Israel started with signs. And if you go back to Moses, you understand they started with signs. Or you may want to go back to Abraham. And you will still see that the Jewish people started with signs. God called Abraham. And he called him at the age of 75. And he promised him a son. He had been barren. And then the Lord said, I'm going to give you a son. And that son did not come until 100 years of age. That is, when he was 100 years of age. It was a sign that he was worshipping a miracle walking God. That's how the children of Israel started as a nation. And eventually they were almost forgotten as they went to the land of Egypt. And now they were to start all over again. And as they were to begin again, God sent Moses to them. When he sent Moses to them, he sent Moses with signs. What's that in your hand, Moses? Ordinary rod. I'm going to make it extraordinary. Throw it down. It became a serpent. That's a sign. Pick it up again. It became a rod. Put your hand in your bosom. It became leprous. Pull it out again and put it in. I became cleansed again. Go back to Israel. And you tell them, the God of the Hebrews have appeared on, has appeared unto you. If they ask you, where is the sign? Show them that sign. If they don't believe the first sign, they'll believe the second sign. They, are, they, were, they were people that were kind of arrested by signs. But the time came when the children of Israel, they didn't see their signs anymore. We're looking at Psalm 74, verses 9 and 10. We see not our signs, and there is no more any prophet. Neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. O God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? As we look at that verse 10, you must think back on the words of Pharaoh. What if, uh, what if Moses only went with academic knowledge? What if he only went with logic? What if he only went with the grammar of the day? What if he only went with human skill? Pharaoh would have continued blaspheming the name of the Lord. And Pharaoh would have continued kind of oppressing them. O oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? When there are no signs, when there are no wonders, when there are no miracles, that's what the adversary will do. And then it says in that verse 10, shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Pharaoh would have kept on blaspheming, except for the signs that he saw. And then eventually they went through the wilderness, and it was a journey with signs. Every time they saw the manna coming down from heaven, it was a sign, the Lord is among you. And they didn't see any feebleness in their knees. It was a sign. The Lord was there. And then the water came out of the rock. All through the wilderness journey, it was a journey with signs. And then they entered into the land of Canaan. And you remember that when they entered the land of Canaan, the signs started all over again. Crossing Jordan miraculously without a bridge, a sign. And the walls of Jericho coming down, that's another sign. And then all those enemies of the children of Israel destroyed like that, that was another sign. 
and when it came to the point on the battlefield and it was getting dark and uh, Joshua still needed some light of the sun and he said son stand where you are stay where you are and the moon don't ever move until I'm able to bring complete victory and I'm more than a conqueror and you'll see that that was sign all through their journey and in their settlement in the land of Canaan sign 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 but eventually, the prophets died out. There was no respect or honor for the prophets of the Lord anymore in Israel. And you know the way it started. Some of the kings that began to reign, they began to bring in idolatry. And they hated the message of revelation coming from the prophets. In fact, you'll see some of the people even said, there's one, there's one man here, when Joshua was saying, is there no prophet that can show us the way? And then the king said, there's one, but I hate him. I don't like him. Don't say that. Uh, call him. And then Micah came and he said, and Ahab said, what's the word of the Lord? If I tell you, are you going to agree anyway? I'm going to tell you. And he prophesied. Didn't I tell Jehoshaphat that he never speaks anything good about me? The time came, they began to hate the prophets of God in the land. And when they began to hate the prophets of God in the land, then all the signs vanished. That's why it now says in verse 9, we see not our signs anymore. And there is no more any prophet. Neither is there any among us that knows how long this will be. Eventually they went into total darkness in the intertestament period. When God sealed up heaven. Closed up heaven. And he will not talk to them. And they didn't see any signs anymore. After 400 years then the Lord Jesus Christ came. Again when Jesus came he came with signs. You see, as the Lord wants to actually rebuild his church and he wants to visit the people of God again, the people, he says, they come with signs. Uh, you're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, when Jesus Christ came, he came with signs. You are noticing something already. Whenever God wanted to convince the children of Israel, I am present. I want to become prominent. And I'll be preeminent among you. The way he did that was to bring a minister. Or was to bring the redeemer. Or he'll bring the savior. Or he'll bring somebody, his servant, his son. He'll bring him signs and wonders. In verse 22 of Acts chapter 2. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. A man approved of God among you by miracles and by wonders and by signs which God did by him in the midst of you as see yourselves also know and eventually you you know that Jesus Christ went about doing good healing out all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him he was about to leave his disciples now and what did he tell them Mark chapter 16 as the Lord Jesus was living and was committing the work into their hand. Again, signs were told in Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then. After the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And he went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. Do you see that? That when the Lord sent forth the people, he sent them forth with the ability to walk signs and wonders. Tonight we are talking about those signs. But we're talking about the signs for commissioned leaders. Commissioned leaders. The word commission. Now there's a difference between being called and being commissioned. There's a difference between being converted and being commissioned. The Lord Jesus called his disciples and said, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. They rose up, they followed him. That day he didn't commission them. And then they went along with him. He was teaching them. After each teaching, he didn't commission them. He even them gave, he gave them power and he said go but you must come back he didn't commission them but eventually there came a time when he commissioned them and what's the process of commissioning 
Because as we are here, we're talking about signs for commissioned leaders. Please understand, it's not signs for careless leaders. Not signs for carefree leaders. Not signs for unconcerned leaders. And it is not signs for critical leaders. Signs for commissioned leaders. There were many children of Israel, but God only commissioned and gave sign to Moses. And there were many people at the time of Joshua, but God commissioned Joshua and gave him signs. And there were many people all through the journey and all through the pilgrimage of the children of Israel, but God commissioned his own servants. And it's a process you go through as you are commissioned. Number one, converted and set apart. Well, you, you first of all come to the Lord. And then you are converted and you are set apart. And you know for this reason, was I born for this reason, did I come into the world? I knew you in your womb, the Lord told Jeremiah. And I set you apart that you will do my work. Now don't say I'm only a child because you will go to all the people I will send you, all the places I will send you, converted and set apart. Number two, consecrated and sanctified. If any man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work, cons consecrated and sanctified. Uh, you know, there are many people, you know, they're in the meeting and they say, Holy Ghost is coming, anointing is coming, power is coming, signs and wonders are coming. Everybody receive. And there are some people that maybe they're sleeping through the meeting, or they're not even paying any attention at all. Or they are not writing anything. Or the Lord, they are not getting the word of the Lord from what the Lord is saying. And they just take it like another Bible study. Another sharing. Another preaching. There is no eagerness within them. And they are not laying anything upon the altar. They are not consecrated and sanctified. The Lord is not going to just commission them like that. And put his signs upon them. Number three. Committed and separated unto the Lord. My, uh, the God that separated me from my mother's womb. That's what uh, Paul said. He said, he gave me the word. And then I did not confer with flesh and blood. When you become so committed and separated unto the Lord, and you know there is just one thing to live for in your life. You are getting through in the process of being commissioned by the Lord. Number four, crucified and submissive. Not my will. Thine be done. The eye at the center of sin has been crucified, has been crossed out. And the I at the center of pride had been crossed out, crucified and submissive. What will you have me to do, Lord? Do you remember when Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, when the Lord met him on the way to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? He knew it must be the Lord, but you know whether it's God Himself, the God Almighty, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, or is it Jesus Christ? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you persecute. And then immediately he is surrendered. Pride gone. And the aggressiveness against the church of the living God went away. What will you have me to do? I'm submissive now. I surrender all. I surrender all to Jesus, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Go to Damascus. It shall be revealed to you. It shall be told you what you will do. Crucified and submissive. Number five, conscientious and steadfast. Conscientious and steadfast. There's only one dream. Only one goal. Only one pursuit. Only one desire. And all those childish things, all those things are passed away. I want to build the skyscraper. I want to own the best car in town. I want to build the greatest building in town. I want to have this, I want to have this, which is just self speaking out from within. All that is gone. You are now conscientious and you're, and you're steadfast. And then number six, consumed and scripture saturated. Consumed and scripture saturated. You are consumed with the mission. You are consumed with the ministry. You are consumed with your calling. You are consumed with what the Lord has called you and selected you to do. And then you read the scriptures. Not only read, you study the scriptures. Not only study, you, you flip through the Bible and you swallow the Bible, so to say. And you're not swallowing it and reading it and digesting because you want to preach. You just want the word of God. Nothing else will satisfy you. You read it, you read it again. You read it, you read it again. I thought I was reading too much of the Bible. Until I went to this last conference I spoke about. And although I was the main speaker there, speaking about three times or 
two or three times every about two times perhaps every day or three i'm not sure now and then there was another person that was uh, giving a message he spoke once each day and then he said in their church the commitment was that by the age of 30 you shall have read the bible through 30 times when you are 40 you must have read the bible through 40 times when you are 60 the church expected you their church expected you that you should read the bible through 60 times and then I said, I've been reading the Bible. I think I've read it so much. But now, with that challenge, I said, I'm searching again. Saturated with scripture. Consumed and scripture saturated. Because you're looking for something. You say, there's something hidden for me in this world. There's something hidden for me. It says treasure house. There's something I need to dig up from this for the benefit of my life. Not just so much because I want to preach to other people. And it is number one when you are called and when you are converted and set apart and then you are consecrated and sanctified you are committed and you are separated to the lord you are crucified and submissive to the lord you are conscientious and you are, and you are steadfast you are consumed and your scriptures saturated then are you called commissioned and sent then the process comes to the point of your being commissioned, called, commissioned, and sent. And it's those kind of people I'm talking to tonight that will have the signs of the ministry. There are three points we're going to look at in the message. Number one, our calling and promise of, this, of supernatural signs. Our calling and promise of supernatural signs. Number two, our commission and power with soul saving signs soul saving signs our commission and power with soul saving signs number three our consecration and prayer for spectacular signs our co our consecration and prayer for spectacular signs i come to your point number one our calling and promise of supernatural signs if you look at second corinthians chapter 12 verse 12 there's something for us to note here second corinthians chapter 12 verse 12 as we look at this verse of scripture it talks about sign a special kind of sign truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds i'm here to tell you tonight to reveal to you here tonight there are different kinds of signs they're all miraculous and they all come through the spirit but it depends on the kind of calling you have it depends on the kind of commission you have there is a calling for the apostle there's a calling for the prophet there's a calling for the evangelist there's a calling for the pastor and there's a calling for the teacher and as a calling for the deliverer and as a calling for the follower for the believer in the lord jesus christ and there are signs of the apostle and there are many people that they waste a lot of time they don't check up what's your calling what's your commission what has the lord called you to do in the case of paul the apostle in fact uh, paul the apostle you will uh, you need to study him more he was an apostle of course and he was a prophet too Behold, I show you a mystery which shall not hold that. That's the voice of a prophet. He was an evangelist. I want to preach the gospel not where Christ has been named, but where Christ has not been named. So I'm not building upon another man's foundation. He was an evangelist. And he was a pastor. If I'm not a father to you, if I'm not a father to others, I'm a father no doubt to you. You may have 10,000 instructors, but you only have one father. Because and the Lord have begotten you unto the Lord by the gospel. He was a pastor. And he was a teacher, of course, a teacher of the word of God. And he taught everywhere, teaching the people the doctrine of the word of God. I've not hidden anything from you. I've showed you from house to house. And publicly, I've shown you everything in the word of God. I've not neglected or shown to declare to you the whole counsel of God. A teacher, a, a pastor, an evangelist, a prophet, and an apostle. And therefore, you find a lot of signs in his life in his ministry in his mission and yet particularly peculiarly there are signs of the apostle and it says over here what those signs are truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs 
and wonders and mighty deeds. Have you noticed that it doesn't matter where Paul the apostle was, the signs were there. He went to the synagogue, the signs were there. It was for the heathen on the streets of Illyricum. And the signs were there. To the point that he even thought he was a god. And then he was in the prison. And he began to sing with silence. And the signs came. The signs of miracles and wonders, they were there. He was in the boat now in the ship. And they were carrying them away to Rome. And he told them, you should have listened to me. But you didn't listen. And again, the signs were there. An angel of the Lord appeared unto me and said, He has given me all the people that sail with me. They came down, they came to an island. As they came to the island, they were gathering sticks so that they will be able to make fire because it was a time of cold. And a snake was, uh, you know, around his hand. And the people looked at him as if he would swell up and he will die. He shook it up. It was a sign. And the people, when they saw that sign, they saw it's not, they said, It's not a criminal, this one is a God. The signs of an apostle. That everywhere, anywhere, the signs were there. And you know that the signs were not attached to any emotion. Because in the prison, it wasn't, on, it wasn't having a high emotion, a great emotion. And in the prison, it wasn't, uh, you know, find very, very happy. It said, in fact, they within were fierce and without were fightings. And yet, in the midst of it all, the signs were regularly manifested in his life. The signs of an apostle, I about the prophet. I, the, the Jeremiah, you know, told the people, well, know who is the prophet. Have, when we see the sign, what's the sign? When what he says comes to pass. Then we will know a prophet indeed has been in our midst. There's a sign of the prophet. And did you hear Paul the apostle when he told that man in Lymas the sorcerer? Because that's his name by interpretation. That shall be blind. And you will not see the sun for a season. He proclaimed and a prophesied judgment upon him. Immediately the cloud of darkness covered that man and he became blind. That is the sign of the prophet. And it's there in the life of the apostle Paul. And the prophet Paul too. And then the sign of the evangelist. Do you remember Philip? He had the sign of the evangelist. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Reading from verse 5. Acts chapter 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. And preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord give heed unto those things which Philip really spake. And hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with pulses and that were lame and they were healed and there was great joy in that city that's a sign for the evangelists he goes to the places where christ had not been named and where they had been under the power of occultism of witchcraft of sorcery and yet he declares the word of God. And you see here, now please understand me, don't misunderstand. Please don't misunderstand. We need our choir. We need the soloists. We need the instrumentalists. We need all these, uh, all these people that are helping with us in the ministry. They are great, great talents and gifts of the church. But the point is that Philip the evangelist did not have all that privilege of having a good power like ours. And of having a great building like ours. But you see, an evangelist doesn't have to depend upon that walking stick. And doesn't have to depend upon all those props. Because the sign of the evangelist will be there. That you know sometimes it goes like that. And then without any choir. And without uh, the people that will really be a blessing to him in the ministry. That uh, he, he will come and then he proclaims the word. And God begins to heal the people. And demons are cast out. And by the grace of God, I've gone to places that um, I was in a particular place that they need him not to sing Jesus only is our message. Jesus our team shall be. We lit up Jesus ever. Jesus only will we see. Announce the song Jesus only. I read it through. And then I saw the choir. I said, Can you play it for us? And they couldn't play it. And then, uh, you know, they couldn't even sing it well. And uh, sometimes when they are singing and you know the voice is here, the voice is there, and the, the voice is uh, discord all over. And sometimes you have to, you know, in a way methodically just tune them off and not even listen to the song. And then after they have sung a song like that, and then I come up and, and with the ministry of the evangelist. 
And then the Lord begins to walk and people get healed and people get delivered and then I give the altar call and then the people come forward and he give their lives to the Lord. And by the grace of God, abiding fruit. Some of those places have gone back there and they will tell me I got born again 17 years ago when you were in our country. I got born again about 10 years ago when you were in our country. Great, great things, mighty things happening. Even when we don't have all the help we have over here back at home. The sign of the evangelist. And of course, the sign of the shepherd is there. The sign of the pastor is there. And if I can borrow from the Old Testament, David, he was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. And he would live, his very life, he lay on the line to care for the, uh, for the leaves in the fold. A lion came to the fold, to the flock, and took one lamb out. And then I caught him. I put my life in my hand because he had the heart of a shepherd, the heart of a pastor caring and loving uh, you know there are we, we sometimes hear testimonies from some of our uh, people and uh, the testimony is that uh, that her brother is a great pastor at heart and anytime it's not at home it will affect their church it will affect it may be a district it may be their group or it may be a region they just love him. As a, a pastor here was uh, preaching yesterday on the Holy Ghost, and the pastor was uh, mentioning that he doesn't understand why some of our pastors will say, uh, this is a difficult place because they are not of my tribe, I'm not of their tribe, they don't love me. And he gave us his own testimony. He had been in the north by the grace of God. He had been in the west. He had been in the east. He had been almost all over. Because, uh, you know, God just gives him the grace. And any time I called him and I said, hey, Brother, uh, we need you now. You are going to be the state of Asia and Ogun State. Yes, sir. And then I say, now Ogun State is enough. You are going to be in a quarrel, maybe a quarrel before Ogun State. Yes, sir. And then I said, now we need you in a, a number state. Yes, sir. And anywhere we need him, you know, any, and sometimes when he talks to me, I don't know whether he's joking with me or not. He laugh and I say, hey, Pastor, I'm still waiting. Where is the next place again? Then I laugh and say, stay where you are. You know, he, but he has, he has the, the pastor's heart. And then he said, you know, he testified last night. He said, anywhere he went, old women would say, Pastor, Pastor. I hope they will do that to me. You know, a wonderful man of God. You see, when you are a real pastor, the signs of the pastor, the signs of the pastor will be there. That's the love and the compassion and the caring. And then the accommodating of the people. The sign of the pastor. Of course, the teacher. The teacher has his own sign too. In John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're looking at John chapter 3 and I'm looking at it from verse 1 through to verse 2. And then I might even join verse 3. In John chapter 3 verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. We see the signs. You are a teacher, not an ordinary teacher. We know that you are a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He was a teacher and the people knew. They didn't know he was savior yet. They didn't know he came to redeem them from all their iniquity yet. But there was something they saw. They saw that the signs of the teacher were obvious, visible, manifest in his ministry. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Don't you see that this is a teacher? And don't you see the man came and he said, We know you are a miracle worker. And we know you are a teacher come from God. And then he stretched for the carpet of flattery. And Jesus Christ just brushed all that aside. And he came into his ministry to emphasize the really important thing. I'm saying to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then as he explained that to him, Nicodemus said, I'm confused. I'm an old man. How can I be born again? And then Jesus did not repeat the same thing. Jesus said it another will be born of water and of the spirit. But how can this thing be? It is like the wind blowing. You, you see the illustration. Because the illustration is the window through which the light of knowledge will come in. That's the teacher right there. The signs of the teacher manifested in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, looking at the um, concluding verses, that is, uh, you have verses 28 and 29. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The signs of a teacher. 
And as you determine the commission that God has given you, the calling that God has given you, if the Lord has called you to be a teacher, be a teacher. If the Lord has called you to be a pastor, be a pastor. If the Lord has called you to be an apostle, be the apostle. And then if the Lord has called you to be a deliverer, go and, go and deliver my people out of the land of captivity. Then do what the Lord has called you to do. The signs of the deliverer. I'm looking at Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. And I'm reading from verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land, and in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. The signs are there. Our calling and the promise of supernatural signs. Where is the promise? I read it to you already in Mark. Let's look at it again in Mark chapter 16. In Mark chapter 16 verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. If you stop there for a moment. There are signs for believers too. The believers signs. But uh, let, let's let's uh, make it deep a little bit let's dig into this a little bit i've called you what have you called me for i've called you to be an apostle lord i believe this sign shall follow them that believe their calling i've called you to be a prophet lord is that so yes i rest you up and you will pull down you will throw down you will root out and you will destroy you will build and you will also plant Lord, thank you, I accept. You have called me to be a prophet. Lord, I believe. This sign shall follow them that believe. And the signs of the prophet will be manifested. I've called you. I know that all believers are soul winners. All believers are supposed to be witnesses unto me. But I'm calling you special to be a soul winner, a witness and an evangelist. Lord, thank you. I accept. Today, I declare. I confess what the Lord has said. I am an evangelist. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe. This sign shall follow them that believe. If you believe the calling that God has given you, then the signs that are peculiar to the calling that the Lord has given you, that sign will be visible, manifest, open, active, operative in your life. And if the Lord has called you to be a pastor, and maybe you, 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 you think you've never been a pastor. I don't have time to tell you stories tonight because of our time. But you see, there are times in my field, I cannot do this, I, can, I cannot do that. If the Lord has called you to be a pastor, then just say, Lord, I know it's your calling. And it is not by power, it is not by might, it is by my spirit, says the Lord. And when the Lord calls you to do a particular thing, he equips you, he prepares you, and he makes the signs to come in your life. And you'll just find that God makes you like a magnet. And, uh, you know, the, the, the magnet will be attracting the people into the fold, into the kingdom of God. Once you say, yes, Lord, I believe. This is my calling. He has made me a pastor. These signs shall follow them that believe. You believe what the Lord has called you for. The signs will come. I've called you to be a teacher. And there are people that the Lord has called to be teachers. And some of them, they have the natural, the natural talent to be teacher. And then after that, they come to the Lord. And the Lord takes over that talent. And then they become real, real teachers of the word of God. And when the Lord gives you that calling and say, yes, Lord, I accept. I accept. Then once you accept, the signs of the teacher, authoritative leader, teacher, effective teacher, welcome. These signs shall follow them that believe. But when the Lord has called you, and the Lord has gifted you, if you don't develop it, if you don't uh, put some strength and some planning and some structure to your life, so that you will actually be in the real sense, in a practical sense, what the Lord has called you to be, the signs may not show. But these signs shall follow them that believe. Tonight you believe. I say tonight you believe. You believe the particular calling the Lord has given you. If the Lord has used leadership, either the Lord has used your region of Asia to put you there. Accept it is coming from the Lord. The Lord only used the region of Asia as an instrument. 
And if the Lord has used our state of us here to put you there, believe that the Lord has put you there. It's only the Lord used the state of us here. Or if the Lord uses the general superintendent that he puts you there. Instead of saying, is this all I'm going to have? Is this all I can do? Can't I do more than this? How is it they are going to tell me to just do this? And more than this, if you don't think like that, wherever the Lord has put you, and you say, yes, Lord, here is where you have put me. In fact, it's just that when we preach, we mentioned overseer, we mentioned state overseer, national overseer, but you need to understand. Because as you read the word of God, I told you there's not much time tonight. As you read the word of God in Exodus, Exodus 31, Exodus 35, Exodus 36, you will see that when they were to build the tabernacle, God commissioned some people and he named them and he said, you will build the tabernacle. It was a commission. And then the sign was given to them. The spirit was given to them. And the kind of spirit that was given to him when he was commissioned to build the tabernacle, that kind of spirit was not given to Moses. Study the Bible, you'll find that to be so. That the commission that was given to him was to build the tabernacle. And then for Moses was to deliver the children of Israel. And the Lord gave the spirit and the sign appropriate for the calling and the commission that the Lord had given. And so whatever the Lord has called you for, he may use me, he may use our overseers, or he may use, even use our group coordinators, or he may use anybody to encourage you and put you there. Just stay there. Don't argue. Just accept. And then you will see supernatural signs. And you will do greater things in that place, in that ministry. More than you will be able to do in other places that you are cringing for. That you are craving for. That say, that's where I want. That's the one I want. If they don't give me that, I will not be happy. We may give you that if you twist our hand uh, strong enough. We may give you that if you maneuver and, uh, and you kind of uh, do whatever you want to do to us and, give pressure and put us in pre a serious pressure. We may be able to give you something to do that you like, that you want. If you uh, make the fire of uh, you make, make contention to burn strong enough, and we don't want you to burn down the whole auditorium, we may say, okay, why, why do you want to burn the auditorium? It's because you didn't make me this. That's what I want. Say, so, okay, is, do you want to go out of the church? No, I will not go. But what I will do, I will do. But it's not time now. Ah, if you say it's not time now, I will motivate the people to burn down your auditor. I'll say, okay, don't burn it down. What do you want? This is what I want. Okay, take. And let us, you will take it, but there will be no sign. There will be no result. The Lord will not back it up. And you see, there are some people that leaders may permit. Because God himself even permits people. He gave them the desires of their hearts and he sent leanness unto their souls. There are people that the leaders may just permit. Don't burn down the auditorium. Don't scatter our church. And don't uh, destroy. I've been building it for a long time. Don't destroy. And if the only thing that will make you restrain you not to destroy is to have this position, okay, have it. It's between you and God. But when you have it, you're not called to it. You're not commissioned for it. And the Lord is not going to give you the signs to succeed. In what the Lord has not given you, you got it by twisting our hand. But when you believe the Lord, that these are the calling of God upon your life, then the signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover I pray that we'll have the signs. I said we'll have the signs. Point number two, our commission and power with soul-saving signs. Our commission and power with soul-saving signs. Eventually, the Lord Jesus commissioned his own disciples. We're looking at, Je at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Reading verse 16. In John chapter 15 verse 16 it tells us in this verse of scripture the commission that came to them you have not chosen me but i have chosen you you have not chosen the position you want to be i have chosen you for the position you have not chosen the title you want to bear i have given you the title i want to give you Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. That's the commissioning right there. 
that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your food should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you, the commission. And now the power also followed after. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8, But you shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And once again, I want to remind you, again, please, you mustn't misunderstand. Uh, because you see, there are people uh, that maybe it's like they're looking for fault. They're looking for something to hold on. They're looking for something to criticize. You know, the pastor said he doesn't need this people, doesn't need. I didn't say that. I'm, I'm just interpreting scriptures to you. That when the Lord starts a ministry, when the Lord starts a church, we look unto the Lord and unto the Lord only. And the power for ministry comes from the Lord. And the resources for ministry will come from the Lord. And the wherewithal to make the ministry successful will come from the Lord. And you'll see in the primitive church, I'm using the primitive in the sense of the early church. I'm using the word primitive in the sense that the church was pure without any tradition. And was pure without any kind of human ingenuity, any, any kind of maneuvering, any kind of um, things that people do through, you know, to just say, we must do this, we must do this. But say, she shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you know they didn't have much money? Do you know they didn't have any church building? And do you know they didn't have too many workers? And do you know they didn't have singers? Do you know, do you know they didn't have seats and benches? Do you know that the early church, when Jesus left them, if you were to take inventory of all the property that the church had, all that the church in the whole world had will not be up to what we have at the IBTC here. They didn't have that. And yet the Lord said, what you need, the greatest thing, will be the power, not the money. And not the singers. And not all these other various things. You know, sometimes uh, we send out uh, missionaries, and, and those missionaries do not understand. When you go to a virgin land, and when you go to a new place, that you have the power of the Holy Ghost, you have the commission, and you have the power. And over there, if you come back, if you are turning your mind back home, how many ushers we have in Lagos? You say, even the ushers is enough to form a congregation. And if they will give me, let the some ushers follow me. And then I need a music a person to follow me and, you know, to, to train the people for music. And I need a days and I need this. I need a youth leader. I need a women leader. I need this, I need that. Let them all follow me. If they really want to work in my country to succeed. The early church did not start that way. And the early church did not have all that money. All those people. All those materials. And yet, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And there are times that some missionaries, you know, they, they've gone. They came in maybe in January. That is, uh, January the, the previous year. And then they had a little amount of money with them. And because maybe they think the money is not enough, in March, they are back. I would say, brother, why are you back in March? You just went. When you finished the Congress in January, you stayed about two, three weeks before you left. You've gone for only one month. You are back again. How is the work there to be done? And then he says, hey, Pastor. There's no money. Pastor, we don't have this. We don't have this. We don't have this. Understand, when you are commissioned by the Lord, appointed by the Lord, anointed by the Lord, and you seek the face of the Lord, you have the power. And then when you have that power, everything you need, we're not saying we're not going to hell. That's why I said, don't misunderstand me. And don't misinterpret what I'm preaching. It will be unfortunate if your father is speaking to you and then deliberately, intentionally, with a bad attitude, with a critical mind, with a negative attitude, you take the words of your father and you twist it 
And then you tell your junior brother, you tell your senior sister, uh, brother or sister, and then you blackmail your father in the presence of one of his children because, uh, you know, you are not a good child. A good child will not understand what daddy is trying to say. And what the father is trying to say, the father is saying, look up to God. Your father in the Lord is saying, depend upon God. Your father in the Lord is saying that even if you don't have all the choir we have in Lagos, all the choir we have at the headquarters, and all the ushers, and all the money and everything, that you look unto God. I'm even talking to the headquarters too. Because in our district churches here, there are some of the district churches that, you know, they sit down there. And there have been maybe about 250 or 270 from about five years now. And they're still like that. And then you ask, you say, what's the problem? We've gone to the betting committee, they have not approved money. And because there's no building, that's why the people are not coming. Uh, that was, that's not the early church. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The commission and the power. And it's the power that helps us in saving souls. And let me show you. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 24. In Acts chapter 4 verse 24. And when they had that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine of vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done and now Lord behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders, signs and wonders, signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. They were not asking for material things. Material things, if they are there, we thank the Lord. If they are not there, the Holy Ghost is there. If they are not there, the power is there. If they are not there, the breakthrough is there. If they are not there, the blessing is there. If they are not there, we can still win souls. They were asking for the power of the Holy Ghost. When the commission comes, we must have the power that goes along with that commission. And in verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking. Where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake with the word of God with boldness. And then in verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. When the Holy Ghost came upon those people, they became so united, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But he had all things come on, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I believe and I pray that the Lord will do that for us. Great grace upon them all. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 12. Acts chapter 5 verse 12. And by the hand of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought. By the sign, by the hands of the apostles. Because you see there are some special signs associated with apostleship. There are other signs associated with the prophetic ministry. Other signs associated with the evangelistic ministry. Other signs associated with the pastoral ministry. Other signs associated with the ministry of the teacher. In this case now the apostles, by the hands of the apostles, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest does no man join himself to them. But the people magnified them and believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women in so much that they brought for the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Oh there's no time. There's no time. But hey, look at this. The, the, the apostles. Even the apostles had varying signs. Because the apostles they were not the same in stature. 
The apostles, they were not the same in height. The apostles, they were not the same in ministration. The apostles, they were not the same in the ability of the apostleship. But in the case of Peter, the Lord singled him out, apart from above all the other apostles. John was an apostle. He had his own gifting. And he had his own signs. The signs of the apostle. And uh, we are talking of Andrew and the rest of them. They had their own signs. But in the case of Peter, he had his own peculiar signs too. That were told in that verse, in verse 15, in so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets. And they laid them on beds and couches. That at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And thank God that the other apostles did not criticize him. What are you doing? Even Jesus Christ did not do it like that. And Jesus will still have to speak the word and have to cast out the devil. What is it that you are just passing by? Are you sure you are not proud? There's no criticism. They knew that apostles, even though apostles are apostles, the different apostles had the different signs of apostleship. And we're told in verse 16, there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed everyone. I come to point number three. There are consecration and prayer for spectacular signs. Our consecration and prayer for spectacular signs. Uh, we really, we need to consecrate ourselves. But what it means in consecrating ourselves is that we actually give everything we have to the Lord. Our hearts, you give to the Lord. Your household, you give to the Lord. Your honor, your position, you give to the Lord. Your time and your treasure, you give to the Lord. The dearest thing to you on earth, if the Lord is requesting or requiring it, you give it to the Lord. And then skill and intelligence, you give to the Lord. And your future, you give to the Lord. And um, why shouldn't I give you testimonies? Why should I be, you know, so timid and closed up and not testify to you about my life? When you give everything to the Lord, He has a way of raising you up to be what you didn't think you'll ever be. At the university from the very first year, in my first year, uh, the Lord so worked things out because uh, it's like a self-made academic person. I told you the other day, I didn't have money. Daddy didn't have money to send me to HSC to do advanced level. And therefore, I had to do it all by myself. And I still had distinction. And when I got to university, before I even got to university, the way the Lord led me, I was born again at that time. Is that before I get, got into first year, all the books we were going to use in first year, in the areas of maths and physics and everything, I bought all the, immediately I got my admission letter, I got all the books. And then I put the books on the table, I counted them. And then I drew a timetable. How many days will it uh, take me to finish this book, finish the, finish this book on my own? Before I go to my first year, in the first way, before registration, matriculation, I'd done everything I'd gone through. I'd worked the Psalms and everything. By the time I got to the class, it was revision for me. While all the other older people, I was still young, we, we, have a, you know, we had a man there that was very old in his 40s when I was in my 20s. And he, he didn't understand anything. And then after the teacher lecturer taught, then he'll call me and say, I say, come and tell me this thing, all this thing, jargon that they are telling, I don't understand. And then I'll explain everything to him. I learned it before myself. I listen to a lecturer. I'm teaching him now. So everything just talk with me. And I was just books all over. And I couldn't think about anything. I read my Bible and read previous progress and read church history and do some music and do other things. I had a timetable for that. And then uh, the rest, mathematics. I dreamt mathematics. And I thought mathematics. It was, it was in my blood. It was in my mind. And eventually I came through the first year. It was easy. Came through second year. It was easy. When I came through the third year, before we finished the exam, when I took one of the papers, one of our professors ran to me and said, you got 92% in one paper. That's final. Final paper. And even the lecturer, the head of that didn't love me because I, I took my stand in class. He wanted all the students to come and drink power in his house. And I raised up and I said, sir, I don't drink power. He said, why? I said, I'm born again. He said that kind of religion wipe it away from Nigeria. I said, it's impossible, sir. All our classmates came back to me. They told me, ah, you have failed. Before that man became a, before he became head of the department, if you post him as a student, you are gone. You'll never make it. 
and I was taking his paper. And uh, when he marked my paper, he had no choice, and I just stopped the whole class in all my subjects. And eventually, they gave me scholarship and said, come back and read PhD. I said, I'm sorry, I don't want it. What do you want to do? I want to preach the gospel. I laid it on the line, and I said, I just give it to the Lord completely. And when I got back to school, my principal didn't believe in God. He said, I release you. Go and do PhD. I said, no, I'm going to stay here and teach. Because all I wanted was just to preach the word of God. I, I had some boys and girls around me at that time. Scripture union. I was teaching them the word of God. And because of them. And they were not up to 20. Just a few of them. I was teaching them the word of God. Because of that, the scholarship, I threw it away. Opportunities, I threw it away. And eventually I came to Lagos. When I came to Lagos, it was the leading and direction of the Lord. And then eventually when I came to Lagos one day, I was, and during my time in Lagos here for my postgraduate work, I told some of our student campus people before, uh, the psychology teacher, I was in the class, and was teaching rubbish, and was talking about women, about immorality and things. I raised up my hand and said, sir, we're adults here. All this rubbish you're telling us is not part of the subject, stay on course. And that fellow got unhappy, he packed all his books and went out. And all the other students said, see, you have come. You have carried religion into the class again. And you have driven our lecturer away. I said, I didn't, he got hungry. That's, that's his problem. He came back uh, the, the, other time, the next time. And then when he came back, and I was in the class, he began that immoral talk again. It's like you didn't see anything. You see it. He didn't teach anything. Then while he was still there, I packed all my books. I said, bye-bye. I went out. And his subject was compulsory. And I was taking that subject, and I came just for that. And then, um, you know, the following, after I left the class, it still went on without me. The following month, he had a problem with the University of Lagos, and he terminated his appointment. He went out there, and then they said, Kumoye, you have driven this man away. And then I came back to the class. When I came back to the class, they said the subject was no more compulsory. But not only that, I'll give every night to pray. I said, Lord, show me the way. Not the way of salvation. I knew about salvation. And I knew about serving the Lord. I said, what will I do for life? I want to leave everything. And then at the back of our hostel at the University of Lagos, there was a tennis court there. I went there in the night. And I said, God, this life, I lay it down again. I give it to you. Consecration. I was already saved and sanctified, but not filled with the Holy Ghost. I lay it down again. I will serve you for the rest of my life. Take anything from me. I, take, I give it to you. And then the Lord said, all right, you'll not go back to the interior. You'll stay in Lagos. I said, thank you, Lord. Then the following day, I just took my books. I was to go to the class. Then instead of going to the class, I went to the end of the department. The provost of the, of the College of Education, University of Lagos. The head of the department of maths, mathematics, just went to him and said, we need a lecturer. We're short start." And as he was coming out, I didn't know what he went to do with the head of with the provost. I just went in, and there was no preamble, there was no protocol, nothing. I just, oh, it's Kumuye, what have you come for? I said, I have something to tell you. And he said, go ahead and tell me. I said, when I finish my course this session, I want to stay at the College of Education and be a lecturer here. He said, that's all right, thank you, we have accepted you. No interview, nothing. That's how I came to Lagos. Because of the consecration, I laid everything down the previous night. And then the following morning, I went to him. I said, I want to be a lecturer here. And then I said, but uh, my principal, Mayflower School, sponsored me. He said, we'll take care of that. If they need money for us to pay back, we'll pay them back. You don't have to do anything. That's how I came to Lagos. When I came to Lagos, August uh, 3rd, I already gave at, at the house. And then I opened. That same week, we started Bible study with 15 people. That's how Deeper Life started. And then all the gifts that I needed, little by little, stage after stage, the Lord kept on giving them to me because I laid everything down. The thing that was precious to me. And then I was still lecturing and I was also preaching. And it's something I didn't know I could ever do, ever. I didn't know I could ever be divorced from mathematics. You want to understand. Because it was inside me. It was everywhere. And I would develop methods of teaching whatever. And I have some of my students here who are now leaders and in this church. 
and they will know. When I come to the class, I don't need to take notes or whatever. Even when I taught degree students, I just write for them. And I just explain everything. And you ask me any time, I'll just get you through. And yet, when the Lord told me, it is now time to leave. I thought that would be the greatest, the greatest difficulty of my life. But the Lord just gave me the heart to say, I said it before, that I'd given everything, Lord, here is it. And the moment I said that, mathematics was no more in my mind as if I was married to that mathematics. I just gave it up. Eventually, I became full-time. And when I became full-time, some of the signs I never saw, some of the miracles I never saw, and some of the, the dynamic exploits I never saw, and I thank the Lord. And I'm not through yet. I'm still seeking after that God will still just drench me and just drown me in the river of the Holy Spirit. I've told you that will help you. Why shouldn't I tell you uh, before my father died, he told me the secrets of his own life. And when I was young, he didn't tell me much. When I was becoming older, and he knew I was the firstborn, he, he now called me by his side. And then he began to tell me this and this and this and this. I didn't know he would die so soon. And why shouldn't I tell you I'm your father? And I should tell you the secret so that before you get out of this place, okay, if that's the path my father trod, I'm going to tread that same path. Rise up and pray. Are you laying anything on the altar? Or are you holding everything back? Your life? Your heart? Your household? Your time? Your treasure? Your Isaac? David said, I will not offer anything to the Lord, which does not cost me something. I lay it down. I give it to the Lord. And it's for those commissioned leaders those consecrated leaders and those submissive leaders and those set apart leaders that the lord will grant the signs determine the calling what calling has the lord given you what commission has the lord given you and as you see the calling that the lord has given you then you will say lord here am i i lay everything on the altar and the signs appropriate for my calling Give it unto me. Lay it now. Don't struggle with God. Lay it now. Don't withhold anything from God. Lay it now. Give your very best. Give your all to the Lord. What shall I give thee, Master? That would each die for me. Shall I give less of what I possess or shall I give all to thee? Jesus, Lord and Savior, that was given all for me. Thou didst leave thy home above to die on Calvary. What shall I give thee, Master? That was given all for me, not just a part or half of my heart. I will give all to thee. What shall I give thee, Master? Thou hast redeemed my soul. My gift is small, but it's all I have. It's my all. Surrender to thy control. What shall I give thee, Master? The giver of gifts divine. I will not hold time or talent or gold, for everything shall be thine. Jesus, my Lord and Savior, thou hast given all for me. Thou didst leave thy home above to die on Calvary. What shall I give thee, my master? Thou hast given all for me, not just a part or half of my heart. I give all to thee.